Good morning. Good morning. I see so many people out this morning. I want to welcome our visitors. We're glad you've chosen to be with us and all those who have found our live stream on our YouTube channel, courthousechurchofchrist.com. Uh, I want to start by making a correction of my own. During our adult Bible class this morning, we were discussing the significant victories and losses that took place at the Valley of Megiddo, and CJ kept bringing up uh, the, the death of King Ahaziah, and I was misunderstanding the context of what we were talking about, but CJ was right, and I just want to tell you real quick, the Valley of Jezreel is in the north, both the Valley of Jezreel and Megiddo are between Mount Carmel and Mount Gilboa. Jezreel is in the north, Megiddo is in the south. Jehu was anointed king over all of Israel while Ahab's son, Joram, was reigning as king. Jehu went to Jezreel. He personally assassinated King Joram, the son of Ahab. His nephew, King Ahaziah of Judah, was visiting him. Jehu gave the order to also have him shot. And you can read this in 2 Kings 9.27. While he was shot in Jezreel, he fled to Megiddo, so he's going south trying to get back home to Jerusalem, and he dies in Megiddo. And that's what C.J. was referencing, and in that case, C.J. was right. Uh, he died in Megiddo, and you can read further on, they brought his body to Jerusalem by chariot. So uh, King Jehu assassinates both the king of Israel and Judah in Jezreel, but Ahaziah dies in Megiddo. So that's, I just wanted to make that correction. C.J. was right. So... Uh, this morning's lesson is entitled, On the First Day of the Week, taking our text from Luke 24, 1 and Acts 20, verse 7. These are just passages that reference the first day of the week. We're going to be talking about a whole host of other things. And I want to thank Kenny for the scripture reading from John 20, verse 1 and verse 19. We'll be looking at those again a little later on. Very soon, actually, we're going to be talking about the different places that it mentions the first day of the week. Wednesday night in our adult Bible class, Bill was leading us in a discussion on worship and talking about why we assemble on the first day of the week. And during that lesson, I thought, oh no, <laughs> I've prepared to teach this. And Bill did an ex excellent job talking about it in class. So afterwards, I went up to him and said, do you mind if I still teach on it or do you want me to, or should I choose something else? And he goes, no, it'd be reinforcement. So this is reinforcement of Bill's class Wednesday night about why we assemble on the first day of the week. So I want to talk about the reason that we're looking at this and why it was important to discuss it in a Bible class setting on Wednesday night, why I want to talk about it today. Sometimes saints are asked why we don't keep the Sabbath. And there are websites after websites after websites, forums after forums. If you were to, to Google it and look it up, you're going to find all manner of Christians out there from all different backgrounds saying we need to be keeping the Sabbath. And so we're often told by usually Seventh-day Adventists, but others will point to some point in time and say that it was a Catholic conspiracy to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And that's why we hear sometimes Sunday described as a Christian Sabbath. And we're going to discuss those things this morning and see, was it a Catholic conspiracy or was this going on shortly after uh, the deaths of the apostles? Was it written? And what did the early church meet together? Our answer when we are told these things of why don't we keep the Sabbath? Our answer is because under the new covenant, Luke 22, 19 to 20 tells us Jesus bought it in his own blood to purchase this new covenant. We meet on Sunday, the first day of the week. And so in this lesson, we're going to attempt to answer the question, why? Why do we assemble on the first day of the week? Why is it on Sunday and not on Saturday? I want to look at the phrase, first day of the week. The word sabaton, this is the Greek word. We're going to be looking at some Greek this morning. I'm going to try to keep it light. The Greek word sabaton, it's Strong's 4521, is a transliteration of a Hebrew word, shabbat, that appears 68 times in the Greek New Testament. 68 times we can read this Greek word, sabaton. 60 of those times it's translated Sabbath or Sabbath day. One of those examples is just one. There's 60 different ones. But Matthew 12, 11 says, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, sabaton will not lay hold of it and lift it out. And so here, Matthew 12, 11 tells us that this word sabaton does refer to the Sabbath. These are 60 of those 68 times. But in the Greek, 
Just like in English, a word that has the same meaning can mean something else depending on words before it or after it, right? The same way is with the Greek, that the end of the word will sometimes vary depending on the meaning. And rather than get into all of that, I just want to show you some examples. So eight of those times, 68 times, Sabbaton appears in the New Testament. 60 of those times, it refers to Sabbath or Sabbath day, but eight of those times, it's translated very differently. Eight of those times, it looks like this. Now, after the Sabbath, that's 4521. This is that Greek word, sabbaton, right? Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week, ice meon sabbaton, Strong's 4521, same word, began to dawn. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. That's in Matthew 28 and verse 1, and I'm reading these from the New King James. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, Mias Sabaton, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. This is Mark 16 and verse 2. Also, in Luke 18, 12, again, the New King James, this, says, this is uh, one of the, in one of the examples, Jesus is telling the story of the Pharisees. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I, twi I fast twice a week. This is dis Sabaton or dis Sabaton. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now on the first day of the week, Mia Ton Sabaton, Strong's 4521. Very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. Uh, Kenny did a good job reading for this for us earlier. Or I'm sorry, he was in John chapter 20, Luke 24, 1, serving as our text. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And John 20, verse 1, which is what Kenny read for us. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And you notice a pattern here. When it says first day of the week, it says Mia ton sabaton. That is the, the Greek translation there. John 20, verse 19, it's the same thing. But it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And Acts chapter 20, verse 7, the second one I chose for our text. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, cited this morning at the Lord's table. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Uh, while these others says Mia Ton Sabaton, this one was Mian Sabaton. But you notice a pattern here. Sabaton is accompanied with some other descriptor word that makes up the phrase first day of the week. So eight of the 68 times this word Sabaton appears in the New Testament, it appears differently. These are the eight references to the first day of the week. And in each of these cases, where the Greek word sabaton or its variant appears with, in the New American, it's heis. In New King James, it's mia. I chose mia because that's usually the word that the uh, Sabbatarians or those who are proponents for Christians meeting on Sabbath, they focus on that word mia ton sabaton. But in the New American, it's heis sabaton. And whether it's heis or mia, in the, New King, in the Greek, it is a Greek ordinal word that means one. The translators have chosen to translate sabaton as week in these cases instead of Sabbath, as the evidence in the rest of the New Testament clearly indicates it means. Sabaton in the Greek literally means seven or sevens. And so it's used of the seventh day when it's talking about the Sabbath, but on the first day of the week, it means first of sevens. That's the literal translation, first of sevens. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a second when we answer the question, what does miaton sabaton mean? I went back and forth on this. I didn't want to get it too heavy in the Greek. I took this whole section out. I added it back in. I took it out. I added it back in Friday night. I, I'm going to try to go through it fast. I think there's a, a great way we can understand it very easily. It means first of sevens. That is the literal translation of Miaton Sabaton or Heis Sabaton. If you're reading from the New American as I do, it means those who are proponents 
of meeting on the Sabbath for in the Christian age. They're going to point to this phrase and say, Miaton Sabbaton means one Sabbath or the Sabbath. But the Greek, this word Sabbaton simply means seven or sevens. And so another descriptor is used to talk about what that seven means. For the Hebrews, it easily meant the seventh day. For the Greeks, it meant seven or seven. So Mia or Heis tells you it's the first of sevens. The pagans all had names for the days which indicated which pagan god was to be venerated on that day. This was a comment that I made during class on Wednesday night. And someone asked me after class, well, what are all the names of the days of the week? I didn't want to do that in the comment on class. I have it for you here. So uh, I didn't put it on the slide. It's a lot. I'm just going to go through it real fast because I was asked. Um, the, the website already is uploaded with this outline and the PowerPoint, you can go over that. It has all of these, even the references that you can go and do further research if you like. Sunday is named after the sun, then considered a planet at the time, associated with the Roman god Sol. And in many languages, Sunday directly refers to the sun, meaning day of the sun when we say it in English. And a lot of our names for the days of the week, Monday through Saturday, are old English names four Roman gods that are sometimes translated into the Old English, usually from the Germanic way of saying the Roman gods. Monday is named after the moon, associated with the Roman goddess Luna. But it's Old English for Monday, meaning Monende, and it means the day of the moon. Tuesday is Martis, named after the god Mars, who is associated with warfare. The old English word was Tiwas Day. It was Germanic for T. It's got a T-I-W. Tiwas or Tees Day. And so we can understand that. Tees Day and how that translated later over time into Tuesday. But it meant the God of Wars Day. Wednesday was Mercury. Named after the God Mercury. He was known for eloquence, travel, and guardianship of the dead. In old English, Mercury was pronounced uh, as Woden as in Woden's Day, and it became Woden's Day was Old English, and we can see over time how that became what we call it today, Wednesday. Thursday, named after the god Jupiter, also known as Jove, associated with thunder. In Old English, it's a word that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but it meant it was honoring the god Thunor, so it's the Germanic way of spelling Thunor, and it was Thunor's Day. And so we can see over time how that been, was shortened down to Thursday. Friday, named after the goddess Venus, who is associated with love and beauty. Old English for Frigga Day, honoring the goddess Frigga, similar to Venus in German, and held sway over marriage and domestic life. And so Frigga Day, over time, was shortened to Friday. And Saturday is named after Saturn. Named after the god Saturn, linked to agriculture and time. In Old English, it was Saturn's day. And paying homage to Saturn's influence, we still refer to it as Saturday, as it got shortened. So these are the days of the week and the way that they're named and how, we've, how it's come to be in the shortened forms that we use today. But our Gregorian calendar is rife and rooted in Roman gods' names because it started with the Julian calendar. Uh, which, again, was from Julius Caesar, who was the first Caesar over Rome. But we know them in their old English format. So a simple explanation is that Miaton Mia Sabaton is a Hebrew idiom. The Hebrews did not name the pagan gods on their lips, at least not the Jews who were being obedient to God. Exodus 23, 13 said the Hebrews were not to name the name of pagan gods on their lips, and so they refused to say the name of the days as the pagans around them did. So the days of the week were called by their relation to the Sabbath. So Monday would, or Sunday would be the first day after Sabbath. Monday, the second day after Sabbath, so forth and so on until you got all the way to Saturday, which they would just call Shabbat, which is seven, the seventh, the Sabbath day. So... The Hebrew word for week appears four times in the Old Testament. 
and the Hebrew word for weeks appears 15 times. And in both cases, the singular and the plural is the same Hebrew word, 19 times total, Shabua, Shabua, Shabua. And it, it means literally seven, that is a week, specifically of years, but it could be used as seven in the case of week. And a week meant seven. So we see where we're in our language today in English why we talk about how seven is associated with a week. is because It's rooted in how they counted from the Jews, how they counted to Sabbath. So normally the Greek word sabbaton is translated as Sabbath, but its meaning is seven or weeks or a week. And so it is a cardinal word that means... Uh, or heis and mi are cardinal words that mean one or first. So miaton sabaton just means the first of sevens. In our calendar, Julian first, now we're used to Gregorian. What is the first of sevens day of the week for us? Sunday. It's Sunday. That's what it means by the first day of the week. Uh, in M. Vincent, in his uh, M. Vincent's Word Studies of the New Testament, it said, he states, the noun Sabbath is often used after numerals in the signification of a week. And so even when we see this Greek word sabbaton, there'll be some words next to it that tell us what day of the week it is. So if we put all this together, these passages are correctly translated as the first of the sevens or the first of the week and not one Sabbath or the Sabbath. The weight of Greek authorities and the major Bible translations, including the Latin Vulgate, written in the AD 400s, are consistent. The early Christians gathered together on the first day of the week on Sunday. And so the, the weight of the Greek authorities and the major Bible translations tell us that our translations are right. In these eight senses, we, it talks about on the first day of the week. So I wanted to talk about the significance of the first day of the week. Why is it significant? Why do we pay attention to these passages when uh, it was said to me once, well, there are multiple passages in the New Testament that mention the Sabbath and very few that mention the first day of the week. That's true. Multiple, multiple passages through the gospels, through the epistles that talk about the Sabbath, but they don't talk about Christians meeting on the Sabbath, and we'll talk about that a little later on. So I want to focus on the significance of the first day of the week, and there are a few. The first and foremost is Jesus rose from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, according to the scriptures. So Matthew 28, verse 1, Now after the Sabbath that began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Mark 16, 1-2, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Luke 23, starting in verse 56 through 24, 1. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes, and on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. John 20, verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have made a point to tell us that there is a difference between the Sabbath and the first day of the week. Both of those, as I read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says, when the Sabbath was over or after the Sabbath, or they rested on the Sabbath, and then on the first day of the week. That's, that word Sabbath and first of sevens, that week, are both this Greek word sabbaton. And it showed that when the Sabbath was over, it made a differentiation in those three Gospels that then the first day of the week dawned. And so there is a difference. It's not the same thing. We also see the church was established on the day of Pentecost, which was the Feast of Weeks, or also called the Feast of Harvest. It also fell on the first day of the week. This was also a comment that was made on Wednesday night. In Acts 1, 26 through chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, And they drew lots for them, they're replacing Judas as an apostle, and they drew lots for them, and a the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. 
The word Pentecost is Strong's 4005. It's a Greek word signifying the 50th part of a thing or the 50th in order. So when we read of Penta, Pentecost is 50. It appears three times in the New Testament, Acts 2 verse 1, Acts 20 verse 16, and 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 8. One of the three great Jewish feasts, which began on the 50th day after Sabbath during Passover, is the feast of the harvest or the first of or the festival of first fruits and this was one of the great three feasts that the israelites had to gather together in jerusalem for uh, every year this was there were three feasts that would bring israelites to jerusalem passover and pentecost are two of them and pentecost would take place 50th day after the sabbath during passover and i want to read this in leviticus 23 15 to 21 it says this talking about the Sabbath that took place during the Passover. Because remember, the Passover is a seven-day feast. No matter what day of the week, the calendar that the Passover begins, it's going to go seven days. There will be a Sabbath during the Passover. And so they count from that Sabbath. Notice how they count. Leviticus 23, 15 to 21. Fifty days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. And they talk about, so there's seven Sabbaths and one day. 49 days plus 1 is 50. Pentecost means 50. We get the picture. Pentecost will always start on a Sunday. Pentecost will always be on a Sunday. Always the first day of the week. It was the feast of the harvest where they were to bring their first fruits from the harvest on that day. And they were to count seven Sabbaths from the Sabbath during Passover and add one day. That's always going to be the first day of the week. And so the church was established on the day of Pentecost, which also fell on the first day of the week. The brethren at Troas, Acts 20, verses 5 through 6, came together to break bread on the first day of the week. And I would say this gives us, we, we talk about authority in the scriptures three ways. We talk about direct statement, apostolic example, and necessary inference. This is apostolic example, if nothing else. Acts 20, verse 7, Paul is there at Troas. He's an apostle. After the Passover in Philippi, Paul sailed to Troas. He stayed seven days until the first day of the week and met with them to break bread in Acts 20 and verse 7. Some people ask the question, <clears throat> Why did it take five days to sail from Philippi to Troas? We don't know. The text just tells us it took him five days to do it. We know that in Acts 16, 11 through 12, in reverse from Troas to Philippi, it only took two days. So it's possible to make that trip in two days, but this time it took five. Maybe there was trouble at sea. But we do know from Acts 20, verse 16, Paul was in a hurry to arrive in Jerusalem. He said he wanted to get to Jerusalem before Pentecost. So he's in a hurry. And yet he gets there. It takes him five days to get to Troas. When he gets there, he stays seven days. Why the seven-day delay? It appears it was so he could assemble with them on the first day of the week. And during that first day of the week, there would have been a Sabbath there. And there's no mention of Paul keeping the Sabbath with the brethren. But no, we read of him meeting with them on the first day of the week. I remember talking with someone who was a Seventh-day Adventist who visited our congregation in Alaska for about three years off and on pretty regularly in some of those times. And we had some very good discussions back and forth. And one of those times when we brought this passage up, he told me that this meant it was they were together for the Sabbath meeting and Jewish time would mean at 6 p.m. on Saturday, that's when the first day of the week began. And so it was 6 p.m. Saturday to midnight, not Sunday till midnight, meaning early Monday morning. And I asked him about, I brought up the point that there's no reason to assume Jewish time telling here. Troas, there's no mention of Paul visiting a synagogue. To have a synagogue in a city required at least 10 Jewish men. And we've talked about it before, that the Jews often would hire or bribe or pay Jewish families to move into a city so there could be a synagogue. There is no historical writings about a synagogue in Troas in this time period. There's no reason to assume that this was anything other than Roman time-telling. 
Roman time telling is the way we tell time today, midnight to midnight. And so there's no reason to assume that there was anything to do with Saturday when it says the first day of the week. Troas is several times mentioned in the New Testament. Paul visited here at least three times, Acts 16.8, Acts 16.11, and then here in chapter 20, 5 through 6, and it's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 12. It's mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.13, and a Sabbath day passed while Paul waited to meet with the brethren, and there's no mention of it. I find that very significant, that Paul waits seven days in Troas when he's in a hurry, so that he could be with them on the first day of the week. It tells us, it shows a not only apostolic example of meeting on the first day of the week, it also sets an example that when we travel, we, if it's at all possible within our time frame and ability, we need to meet with the saints in that local area. Paul instructed the church at Corinth to take up their collection on the first day of the week. Here's a direct statement. He also says he commanded, or he instructed, or he ordered, depending on the version of the English modern ver version of the Bible that you have, that he directed the churches in Galatia to do the same, thus establishing a pattern. So a direct statement. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed, New American uses the phrase directed, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so no collections be made when I come. It's important when we talk about this passage, especially important to talk about when we, keep, when we tell people it is a command. It's important to recognize the context is the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. This goes back to Acts 11, 27 to 30. The Corinthian saints made a promise a year ago that they were going to give something and they hadn't done it yet. You can see Paul telling them to fulfill their promise for relief in 2 Corinthians 8 to 9. He's telling them in order to do this, rather than have to go door to door when he arrives, when they meet together on the first day of the week, they ought to bring their collection so it's in the treasury when he comes. He doesn't have to track everyone down. So it sets a pattern for the, for the congregation still today, just as it did for the churches of Galatia. Necessary inference comes in when there are other passages in 1 Corinthians to this letter that indicate that they assembled on the first day of the week. In the matter of the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18, he says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, he mentions them meeting together five times. 1 Corinthians 11, 17, verse 18, verse 20, verse 33, and 34. He mentions them coming together and assembling as the church, five times. Then, when he's talking to them about the use of their spiritual gifts in a first century assembly, 1 Corinthians 14, he mentions it twice of them assembling together. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23, and verse 26. Here's what he says in verse 26. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So, when did they meet together as the church five times in 1 Corinthians 11? When did they assemble twice in 1 Corinthians 14? The necessary inference is when you get to chapter 16 and he says, when you come together on the first day of the week, that's when you bring your collection. So first day of the week is more than just the collection. It is an established pattern for when they took the Lord's Supper and when they came together and using their spiritual gifts in a first century assembly. When meet together of 1 Corinthians 11 and assemble together of 1 Corinthians 14, combined with the instruction of taking up the collection on the first day of every week in 1 Corinthians 16, we get a full picture of what went on on Sunday. Also, the significance of the first day of the week if we turn to secular writings, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch. I just want to bring up two because I feel they are important. Justin Martyr, he was born in AD 100, the same year that secular historians say the Apostle John died. So he was born in AD 100 and he lived to 165. So he lived to be about 64 or 65 years old. In his first apologetics, Weekly Worship of the Christian section, he writes this. says, and we afterwards continually remind each other of these things. 
and the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep together, and for all things wherewith we're supplied, we bless the Maker of all through His Son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Ghost, and on the day called Sunday. He's writing between 100 A.D. to 165 in the, in the, the second century. And he says, we meet, we do all these things, we come together on the day called Sunday. Then he says this, uh, he goes on to say, during this, and I'm not going to read it, I've got it's on the website again, it's in the outline. I just summarized the next three points. He mentions they pray, they take the Lord's Supper, the people all say amen, then they distribute to each as is needed, the deacons send a portion of what is given to those who are absent and in need. Then he has this to say, but Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day, rose from the dead. For he was crucified on the day before that of Saturn, that is Saturday, and on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things which we have submitted to you also for your consideration. Justin Martyr lived between 8100 to 165. And so he was writing within 50 years of the last apostle. And he describes worship offered by the early Christians on Sunday to God. And he gives two significant features of the first day of the week. He says it's the first day that God started creating the world. And it's when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And so he makes this in his apologies of weekly assembly for Christians and says that's why we meet on Sunday and no other day. Another historian writing in that in a similar time period, he's writing from 155 to 220, 155 to 220. So he overlaps, the, he'd be about 10 years old when Justin Martyr died. His full name is Quintin, Quintus Septimus Florens Tertullianus. He's also just known as Tertullian, and he had this to say in his apologies. We celebrate Sunday as a joyful day. We, however, just as tradition has taught us on the day of the Lord's resurrection, ought to guard not only against kneeling, but every posture and office of solicitude, deferring even our businesses, lest we give any place to the devil. He is credited with the first reference to a Sunday rest long before the Catholics came along. However, we do know that they built upon this idea, and we talked about that Wednesday night, that not that long ago, in many of our lifetimes, Sundays, businesses were closed. This goes back to this idea all the way to Tertullian, long before the Catholics arrived. So I wanted to point this out, that this is not a Catholic conspiracy. The man I mentioned to you earlier that frequently visited our congregation in Alaska, he hung his entire belief system on Christians meeting on the Sabbath on that one notion, that it was the Catholics who changed it from Saturday to Sunday. And I tried showing him all of these things. Look at the dates. Again, look at the dates of when they're writing. 100 to 165 is the date, is the lifespan of Justin Martyr. 155 to 220, the lifespan of Tertullian. They were writing within these time frames. The Catholics didn't come around until 600 AD. 10 years before Islam, in 610, long before the Catholics came on the scene. This is not a Catholic conspiracy. These are, these are men writing within 50 to 100 years after the last apostle. And they're saying, we assemble on the first day of the week and even name the day as Sunday. The point that I'm trying to make is in a very short time, after the apostles died, the church was still meeting on Sunday it is consistent with the New Testament pattern, and it's consistent with the significance of the first day of the week in the New Testament. So then people ask the question, why don't Christians keep the Sabbath? This is an important aspect of this lesson. I almost took this out because I didn't want to get too far off, but why don't we keep the Sabbath? This is a valid question that we're asked. We ought to know the answer to it, and not just, well, because we're under the New Covenant. They're not going to buy that. They're going to want to turn to all manner of passages in the Old Testament. And so let's turn to some passages in the Old Testament and answer the question why we don't keep the Sabbath today. They're going to teach us that it was a universal rule and command for all people, Gentiles included. 
Exodus 16, 23 to 29. We're not going to be able to read these. I encourage you to write these down and read these for yourself. I'm just going to summarize. The first time the command to observe the Sabbath was given to the Israelites, they didn't know what to do. Moses had to tell them what it meant to keep the Sabbath. And this was a trial run. This was before it was laid down in the law in Exodus chapter 28 through 11. In this case, it's the fourth command of the Ten Commandments that says, keep the Sabbath day as holy. And so it is kept as the fourth command of the Ten Commandments. Numbers 15, 32 to 36, the first time it was violated, they didn't know what to do about it. The elders came to Moses and they said, this man was found picking up sticks or gathering sticks on the Sabbath. We're told not to break the Sabbath, to keep it holy, but we don't know what to do about it when someone doesn't keep it holy. What do we do? So this, is, this had not been a universal law for all people from all time. They didn't know. They came to Moses. They said, what do we do? Moses consulted with God. The answer was death sentence. He was to be taken outside the camp and stoned to death. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15. We're told specifically the Sabbath observance was given to the Jews as a memorial for their deliverance from Egypt's bondage. Not to all mankind since creation, which is what many of these people try to tell us. That it's since it's mentioned that God rested on the seventh day from his labor, that this was a universal rule. But the Jews had no idea about this law. And so here it's told that it was a memorial for their deliverance. Exodus 31, 12 to 16. Ezekiel 20, 10 through 12. Say it's a sign between God and Israel. Deuteronomy 5, 2 through 3 and verse 12. It says it's a special law for the fleshly descendants of Jacob. But my favorite, Nehemiah 9, 13 to 14. The Sabbath was not revealed until the law was given by Moses to Israel at Mount Sinai. This is what Nehemiah acknowledges and confirms. Once and for all, to me, the matter is put to rest when Nehemiah says the Sabbath was handed down as a law to Israel by God at Mount Sinai. Not a universal law for all peoples everywhere. Only to the Jews. And then as I was discussing with the, this, this gentleman who became rather uh, friendly to us over the years in Alaska, he would say, yeah, but... The Sabbath is mentioned to be forever and perpetual in Exodus 31, 16 to 17. And that's true. So what about forever and perpetual? The Hebrew words that are used here mean in Exodus 31, 12 to 17, the context says they are a sign and covenant with Israel. Forever, you're on the 18, 5, and perpetual, Numbers 5, 25, 13. Here's a better way to understand that in a way that we as Christians would get. These words, the exact same words that are used to describe the Sabbath, are here in Deuteronomy 18.5 and Numbers 25.13, refer to the Levitical priesthood. But Hebrews 7.11-12 says something interesting. When the law changed, there was necessity a change in the priesthood. No longer the Levitical priesthood, but now the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek forever. Jesus Christ is the high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, not Levi. So, forever and perpetual can also mean to the end of an age, or until a thing is fulfilled, or till a thing is no longer necessary. And we certainly see it with the priesthood. If we can understand that, we can understand that when the law changed, it also went with the Sabbath. There is no distinction in the law of God and the law of Moses, as some try to explain away. This man would also tell me that what went away was the law of Moses, but the law of God stands, and that the Sabbath was a law of God. I, there are so many passages. Uh, I have them on the board here. 2 Chronicles 31, 3, 34, 14, Ezra 7, 6, Nehemiah 8, 1 to 3, Nehemiah 8, 8 to 9, Mark 7, 10, and Luke 2, 22 to 24, where you can see it in Hebrew, you can see it in Greek. The Bible makes no distinction between the two. They are one and the same law. God gave the law of Moses. Moses gave the law of God. Moses was the lawgiver, John 1, 17, but it was all God's law, Nehemiah 8, 1 and verse 8. 
The scriptures, whether Old or New Testament, make no distinction between law of God and law of Moses. Moses simply carried out the wishes of God. Nehemiah states that in Nehemiah 8 and verse 14. So again, easily, uh, easy answer to whether there was a distinction between law of Moses and law of God. No, the scriptures make no distinction, but use them synonymously. The Apostle Paul went into the synagogues on the Sabbath in order to teach the gospel of Christ, not to honor the Sabbath day. And you see this in Acts 13, Acts 17, and Acts 18, because this is where he would find both Jew and Gentile alike, and it allowed for a great teaching opportunity. But when he went to Troas, what did he do? He waited seven days to meet when? On the first day of the week, when the brethren were assembled at Troas, not on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was given to the Jews as part of their special covenant with God, not to all mankind in general. So as we conclude, the old covenant, which contained the Ten Commandments, was made at the time the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. You see this in 1 Kings 8, 9 and verse 21. At the dedication to the temple and Solomon's prayer to God, he reminds the nation of Israel of all of these things. And in his prayer, he's telling God, we, you made this covenant with us, including all these laws, when we came out of Egypt. In fact, Deuteronomy 4.13 says this, Moses in his farewell address said, So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Where was the Sabbath law written? On two tablets of stone. Commandment number four. The old covenant has been done away with in Christ. So what does the New Testament teach about these commandments, which were written on two tablets of stone? The old, the old covenant has been done away. So that's what we're going to ask the next question. What does the New Testament say about these commandments, which were written on two tablets of stone? 2 Corinthians 3, 6 to 14. Let's go ahead and turn there, 2 Corinthians 3. And I want you, if you write in your Bibles or you have a highlighter or a pen, I want you to underscore these words. I have done it in my Bible, and it helps when you're studying with someone who wants to say that it's still part of the Ten Commandments. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 6, and underscore these words. In verse 6, verse 5 says, Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. And continuing that thought in verse 6, Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry, but if the ministry of death, here's where I want you to underline or write in pen, in letters engraved on stones, highlight in letters engraved on stones, came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, highlight fading as it was. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. Verse 11 is where I'm at. Highlight, for if that which fades away, that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away, but their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because, highlight, it is removed in Christ. Hopefully, as you read 2 Corinthians 3, 6 to 14 with me, you noted the words engraved on stones. You highlighted passing away or fades away and removed in Christ. Paul is saying that old law with its Ten Commandments were done away in Christ. Ephesians 2, 15 to 16 says it this way. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God and one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. Jesus abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is what? Highlight the law of commandments contained in ordinances. 
What were those ordinances? 2 Corinthians 3, engraved on tablets of stone. Jeremiah prophesied about the change in covenants. In Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. <clears throat> Jesus said the new covenant was in his blood. Matthew 26, 28, Mark 14, 24. We read Luke 22, verse 20 earlier. The Hebrew writer quotes Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and he makes the case that the old covenant has been done away with, and there is now a new covenant in Hebrews 8, 7 to 13, and he quotes it a number of times between Hebrews 8 to chapter 10. He keeps quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 to get it over the head of his audience. There is no old covenant. We are under a new covenant. He says, when the priesthood changed, it necessitated a change in law. Hebrews 7, 11 and 12. Despite the Levitical priesthood being forever, Deuteronomy 18, 5, and perpetual, Numbers 25, 13, it had been fulfilled. Hebrews chapters 9, all the way through chapter 10, 18, quotes Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, over and over and over again to make the case the old covenant was done away with. We are now under a better covenant with better promises instituted by a better mediator. We are reconciled to God in the New Testament church, which was made possible by the death of Jesus on the cross when we obey the gospel. We see that in Colossians 2, 11 through 14. Colossians 2, 16 to 17 is a fascinating passage because Paul said no one is to judge you in festivals or the Sabbath day. Paul says no one is to be your judge regarding the Sabbath or any festival day. What was the consequence for not keeping the Sabbath? It was death. You were taken out and stoned under the old law. Paul would have to be crazy to say no one can judge someone in regards to the Sabbath if it was still in force. Those of us who are in Christ do not need to, nor should we desire to return to the inferior shadows of the old law. Again, the Hebrew writer point, get, beats it over our heads from chapter 7 through 10 that we're under a better covenant with better promises made by a better mediator. The Sabbath day served its purpose and then was taken out of the way. We're also told in Galatians 3.10 and James 2.10 that to keep part of the law makes us guilty of the whole law. In order to observe the Sabbath day under the old law, it, it included rest, Exodus 34. 5, 1 to 3. It included offering a burnt sacrifice, Numbers 28, 9 to 10, and it restricted their travel, Exodus 16, 29. When my friend was telling me that this was a universal law and that Christians still today have to keep the Sabbath, I asked him, what animals does he offer today and where does he do it at? And he said, no, that was a law of Moses. I'm talking about a law of God. And you can show to your blue in the face those passages that use law of God and law of Moses synonymously. And sometimes it does good and sometimes it does not. But this is irrefutable. To keep the Sabbath under the old law, you had to do these three things. Where is it mentioned in the New Testament? If we were to keep the Sabbath today, where is it mentioned the penalty for violating? Can you find a passage in the New Testament that says the Christian is to be taken out of the, the house of God and stoned? I can't find it. That restriction was given to the Jews in Numbers 15, 32 through 36. There is no penalty for violating the Sabbath because under the new law, under the new covenant in Jesus' blood, Luke 22, verse 20, nine out of the ten commandments are repeated, but the Sabbath day is not one of them. And here's a short chart to keep you that for your reference. Exodus 23 through 17 gives them the two tablets of stone that the Ten Commandments were engraved on. No other gods. 
We're also told that under the new covenant, Acts 14, 1 Thessalonians 1, no idols. Also told that, Acts 17, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Matthew 6, 9, James 5, 12, keep the Sabbath day holy, silent in the New Testament. Nowhere are Christians told to keep it. But we are told to honor father and mother, Ephesians 6, do not murder, Romans 13, Revelation 21, do not commit adultery, Romans 13, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, do not steal, Romans 13, 9, 1 Corinthians 6, and Ephesians, do not bear false witness, Colossians 3, Revelation 21, and do not covet, Romans 13, 1 Corinthians 6, Colossians 3. My point with all of that is to show how many times these nine commandments are repeated in the New Testament, but this, the fourth commandment, silence. Nowhere in the New Testament, there's no passage we can turn to that says Christians are to keep the Sabbath day in fact, when the apostles and elders at the church of Jerusalem wrote a letter to the Gentile converts to comfort them from Judaizers who were telling them they needed to be circumcised, they said this, men to whom we gave no instruction. And when they wrote that letter, nowhere on that letter did it say they are to keep the Sabbath. The Gentile converts were told, Peter said this law was a, a yoke that our forefathers are on their shoulders that they could not bear. Why are we trying to take parts of it and put it on Gentile converts? No part of the old law other than what was mentioned in that letter was placed on their shoulders. Sabbath keeping belonged to the Jewish age. If it is in the new covenant, what are the consequences for not keeping it? We're not told because that was under the old covenant. There is no restriction about that in the New Covenant. Now, that's not to say, I'm not saying I don't love Saturdays off. <laughs> we, we all love that seventh day off. But if you have to work, you are not violating it as a Christian. The Hebrew writer speaking of Jesus in Hebrews 7.24 says, But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry, by as much as he's also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. We're no longer under the old covenant, but under the new covenant. We are, we are under a new covenant that was bought in Christ's blood. Luke 22, verse 2. It is called the law of Christ in 1 Corinthians 9, 21. James 1, 25 and 2, verse 12, call it the law of liberty. We are under a better covenant with better promises, initiated by a better mediator, and thus we assemble on the first day of the week commemorating Jesus' resurrection from the dead and the establishment of his church. When someone asks you why we don't keep the Sabbath, that is the reason I want you to give them. We're under a new covenant with better promises by a better mediator. This morning, if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become one, to become a member of the saved body, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb who enacted that new covenant so that you could live a righteous and holy life and one day be welcomed into eternity. If you are a Christian this morning not living right, not living the way that you should, remember the blood that was shed to inaugurate this new covenant, to forgive you of your sins so that you don't have to suffer the wrath of God. And remember the blessings of being part of his family. And you need to repent and make it right this morning. Whatever your request might be, whether the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, come forward now while together we stand and while we sing.